I see the extra water bottle I have in here. So church, we are going to be jumping into a new series this morning. We have moved on from the final hours of Christ, but we're not going to move that much farther on because what I would love to look at is what occurred after the resurrection. What occurred after the resurrection from the moment Christ raises himself to life to the moment of Pentecost uh, 50 days later. And so our future lessons are going to revolve around the interactions that people have with the post-resurrection Jesus leading up to Pentecost. And if you don't know what Pentecost is, no, it's not Pentecostal. Matter of fact, it's where Pentecostals get their name from, but it is a major Christian holiday that is not really quite celebrated in a lot of Protestant churches. I think it's as, as significant of a holiday as Easter, as Christmas, as honoring the death of Christ, because Pentecost is the day in which the Holy Spirit came upon Christ's church, is when the church officially receives its power and presence of God to be Jesus's, to be empowered to be Jesus's witness to the world. And so Pentecost is a significant day. It was a significant uh, commemoration in the early church. And I'd like for us to move to that point. And a matter of fact, it's on May 28th this year, and we'll speak more about Pentecost on that day. But for now in this series, we're going to be talking about what is significant about these moments and the interactions that people have with Jesus after his resurrection, leading up to his ascension, and then to the Holy Spirit coming down and filling up and empowering the church to do all all that Christ commanded. <clears throat> and this morning, we're going to be looking at specifically the story of Mary Magdalene. And we're going to be in John chapter 20, verses 11 through 18. That is where we're going to be at the most of the bulk of this morning. But the, before we can dive in further, I want us to give a little context on who Mary Magdalene was, because there's a lot of misconceptions about Mary Magdalene, because there's at least several Marys we know in scripture. Mary, the mother of Jesus. We know Mary of Bethany, whose sister was Martha, and Mary Magdalene. They are not all the same people. What we do know for certain is Mary Magdalene was a woman from whom Jesus casted seven demons out. And we see that in Luke 8, chapter 8, verse 2, and it says, And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene from whom seven demons have gone out. The name Magdalene most likely indicates that she is from Magdala, which is a city on the southwest coast of the Sea of Galilee. And after Jesus casted out seven demons from her, she becomes one of his followers. However, contrary to what we've heard in some church traditions growing up, there is no direct scriptural correlation or evidence that she is the sinful woman who washed Jesus' feet in Luke 7, or the woman who was caught in adultery that Jesus saved. We just don't have that direct correlation. Yet what we do know in Luke 8, 2, is that 7 is the number for biblical perfection or completion. And it's perhaps that we are meant to understand, as the reader, what the author is trying to communicate is that Mary... Um, was under a demonic, heavy demonic power. And so no, we cannot say that Mary was a prostitute, but what we can say is that she probably didn't have a squeaky clean past to be under the influence of seven demons. And what we know for certain is that Jesus Christ stepped into her life, freed her from her demons, and she became a follower of Christ from that point on. Jesus rescued her from her horrible life of sin. So, there's not much mention about her except in Luke 8 and another significant part of Scripture, which is during the events prior to and leading up to the crucifixion. And what I want us to note this morning is that Mary Magdalene was the, one of the Marys that was present through almost all the sufferings and uh, matters that Christ had to endure. That she was there every step in his final moments almost as a demonstration of her love and faithfulness to the one who saved her. She was present at the mock trial of Jesus. She heard Pontius Pilate pronounce the death sentence. She saw Jesus beaten and humiliated by the crowd. And she was one of the women who stood near Jesus during the crucifixion to try to comfort him. And what we see in John 20 is here she is at the tomb, seeking to honor Christ by preparing the body and giving him what, she, what would be during her time a proper burial. And so, 
if you will with me, we're going to read along in John chapter 20, verses 11 through 18. And it says this, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid them. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And she, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. <coughs> and so what can we learn from Mary's interaction with Jesus at this point in John chapter 20? Well, one, I think we can learn some fundamental truths about sorrow and how we should respond to sorrow through the two questions that Jesus and the angels ask Mary. But what we see ultimately in this post-resurrection encounter with Christ is that sorrow is turned into hope when we seek the risen Savior. And in fact, we should view all of our sufferings in light of Jesus' resurrection. And so the first thing I want us to look at is where does our sorrow come from? And in this passage, in John chapter 20, we see really three places where Mary's sorrow is born out of. And I think we can learn that because our sorrow oftentimes is born from the same sources, the same beginnings as Mary's sorrow. And so in verses 11 through 14, I want us to note that sorrow can be born out of ignorance. Think about it, church. How many times have you experienced sorrow due to being disappointed? Because something didn't work out the way you envisioned, the way you planned, the way you understood, the way you had your life set up. How many times have we experienced that disappointment in life? Because we just simply didn't understand. It wasn't what we planned out. And so I want you in that context to think about Mary's context for just a moment prior to John chapter 20. She experiences the healing, grace, and mercy of Christ. She devotes her life to him. And like so many of Jesus' disciples, she follows him throughout during his ministry. Why? Because she believes that he is the Messiah, that he is the one promised in Scripture, that he is the one who's going to inaugurate a new age, a messianic age, that she's going to usher in the new kingdom of God. Her hopes, her everything is pent up in Jesus. And yet also, like so many of Jesus' disciples, her understanding of Jesus' kingdom, his purpose, and his teachings, especially on his death and resurrection, is incomplete. It's misunderstood. Though Jesus multiple times foreshadows both the necessity of his death and his resurrection for salvation, she is ignorant of this. And thus, the crucifixion for her is a moment of defeat not a victory. It is an unexpected tragedy and what she thought was planned out, not a divine victory, not a divine triumph, not a divine plan. And so therefore, what we need to look at is Mary at this point is experiencing what I would call a double grief, a double kind of sorrow. On one hand, she's experiencing grief over Jesus's death. And in this aspect, it can be assumed that she felt like her whole world was crumpling down. The man that she put everything on, that she followed, dedicated her life to, is dead and he suffered. Her hopes have been dashed. Her joy has been crushed. And now she is in sorrow over the empty tomb because she presumes, as seen in verses 13 through 15, that the body was stolen. All she wanted to do in her grief, like so many of us who grieve over the loss of a loved one, what do we do? We visit the grave. We put flowers on the grave. We're trying to process our sorrow. We're trying to find closure in the midst of life, in the midst of loss. And Mary's no different. She's there at the tomb seeking closure over the death of the one that she loved. And now she believes the body has been stolen, adding insult to injury. 
because she doesn't understand. The point is Mary's sorrow is born out of the fact that she doesn't understand the significance of the empty tomb. And I think a lot of our sorrows are born out of the fact that many times we lack understanding. We are walking many times in ignorance. And it is in those moments we experience bitterness and sorrow when we are confronted with unexpected troubles of life that we didn't plan for. When our vision and clarity is lacking on how or why, why, could this, why is this thing happening this way? See, Mary didn't understand the big picture, and she was ignorant of it, and it caused her grief. But you know what? God lays out the big picture in his word. He lays out the big picture of his return of our restoration and glorification in him, of the undoing of our sorrows and trouble. But you know what? We still become disappointed in God because even though we are given the big picture, we are not always given all the little details between the here and the then. And so oftentimes we are upset because we feel like God isn't working the way we think he should. He's not working according to our plans. Maybe we feel as if his promises are falling through. Maybe we feel as if he has forgotten about me. And let me tell you something, church. When these moments come, and they will come, we must process our sorrow in light of the resurrection because in this event, in the resurrection of Christ, we see God's sovereignty and victory in the fulfillment of his eternal promises in spite of the wickedness and schemes of man. We will not always understand God's sovereign perspective, but we can trust that it is always good. Romans 8, 28. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30 says this, And we know for that those who love God, believers in Christ, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And then those whom he called, he also justified. He declared them innocent. And those whom he justified, he is also glorified. He has lifted us up out of our state of brokenness and sorrow. So we can trust that God's plans are good, even in our misunderstanding or ignorance. But sorrow can also be born out of evil actions. Though we can say ultimately all of Mary's sorrows is born out of misunderstanding and not getting the full picture of things, she experiences a deep sorrow because of evil actions. <clears throat> Remember what I said earlier. She's experiencing a double kind of grief in which she witnessed the wickedness of man towards her merciful, compassionate, and loving Savior. She was at every step of Jesus' final moments, from his trials to his final breath. She witnessed the fullness of human depravity and evil upon her Lord, and that bore a great sorrow in her heart. Yet now her mourning is out of another perceived slight or evil action, and that her mourning, according to verse 11, is due to the tomb being empty. And she believes the tomb is empty because in verse 13, she believes they have stolen the body. Well, who is the they? Perhaps it's what she thinks is the leaders and the evil men who crucified Christ. The point being is in her mind, they had killed Christ. They had crushed her hope. They had seemed to triumph over God's purposes. And now they have taken the one thing that may bring comfort to her ailing soul, the body of the one she loves. This grief, this sorrow seems unbearable. You can almost hear the desperation in her voice when she's talking to the angels and to Jesus. She is hurting so physically and emotionally blinded by her grief, she fails to even recognize the presence of supernatural beings, which when you look through all of Scripture, when people encounter angels, they know they're encountering angels. The response is usually one of humility, awe, worship, fear, whatever the case is. But in this moment, nothing else matters but the body of Christ to what she believes will ease her grief born from evil actions. Sadly, if she saw her sorrow through the light of the resurrection, the empty tomb should have resulted in praising instead of mourning, signifying that Christ 
is, is ultimate in his victory over death itself. And our own hope and our own resurrection can be solidly founded because our Savior lives. We too often experience sorrow, church, because of perceived wrongs and injustice we have been dealt with by strangers, by coworkers, by friends, even by the ones that we love. We look at the evil in this world, and in one sense, the evil in this world should bring a sorrow and grief in our heart. It is a godly sorrow, a godly grief. This grief isn't born out of feeling hopeless in situations. It is born because we see so many people living without hope. Yet, if we are truly honest with ourselves, we experience sorrow in the face of evil because you know why? It sometimes feels like as if evil is winning. And we ask God as believers, how much longer? How much longer do I have to deal with this? How much longer are you going to allow the wickedness of this world continue? But church, it is in these moments that we need to be reminded that God is sovereign. Nothing can thwart or even threaten the plans of God. The resurrection, God's greatest triumph, should remind us daily of this fact. I want you to remember something, church. God used the utmost wickedness of man to fulfill his purposes, to bring about the greatest good for humanity, the salvation that we can only find in Jesus Christ alone. Scripture acknowledges this in Acts chapter 4, verses 27 through 28. It says, For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. But what is it for? To do whatever your hand, and that hand being God, and your plan had predestined to take place. God used even evil, broken, messed up circumstances, and he used that and brought about his good, gracious, and glorious purposes. Church, we cannot be discouraged when we see evil in the world. We can be sorrow, sorrowful. We can experience grief. We can experience a genuine concern for those who are lost. But we cannot respond without hope. Because our God has triumphed even over the grave and brokenness of humanity. But another thing I want us to note is sorrow can be born out of the death of those that we love. Don't let anyone ever make you feel, and let me, let me preface this, church. Don't let anyone ever make you feel wrong for mourning over the loss of a loved one. I have sadly been to many funerals where well-intentioned Christians go to someone in the greatest depth of their grief and go, well, at least you know they're in heaven. You should dry those, che che dry those tears. They're in a better place now. And yes, that is true. Absolutely. But that is not helping me in this moment. Give me time to grieve, to mourn, to process. And that is okay, church. It is perfectly okay to express sincere sorrow over death. Why? Because death was never something we were designed to experience. Sin brought that about, not Christ. And so we may feel the loss of a loved one for a lifetime. My dad has been gone now for... Was it been five, six, seven years? And every day I still feel his loss. But the way I mourn today is not the same as the way I mourned yesterday or the day before. Christ has given me an enduring hope in my suffering and in my sorrow. Understand, church, God made us to shed tears and to weep, and even weeping could be good therapy in the midst of loss. However, our sorrow must be markedly different from the world and that we do not mourn because in death we fear we will never see them again or because they have gone to heaven if they're a believer but we mourn because they left us and we miss them and our heart aches for the joyous reunion that we will have with them and with Christ see Jesus speaks of sorrow turning into joy when he speaks of his death and resurrection and though jesus foreshadows this and it should be accepted as truth understand something the truth doesn't necessarily alleviate your pains in that moment it doesn't change the immediate impact of our emotions when we experience something tragic i don't think i've ever 
lost someone or experienced pain and then just read scripture and oh, all of a sudden my pain is magically gone. No, I'm still hurting. It's still awful. It doesn't make me a bad Christian. It makes me human in a broken world. But you know what the word does do for me? It allows me to process my sorrow. It gives me an enduring hope in the midst of my sorrow. It doesn't allow me to fall in despair. Though I am mourning, my joy remains in spite of my tears. And so we see Jesus speaking of sorrow turning into hope in in regards to his death and resurrection in John chapter 16, verses 19 through 20. And it says, Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you were seeking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while you will not see me. And again, in a little while you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Jesus is speaking of the sorrow born from his death, but the joy born of his resurrection, and that we must process our sorrow in light of his resurrection. And so, um, yet in this situation, I want us to see that Mary's sorrow, though, was ultimately unnecessary, because unlike our sorrow, which is marked by an actual body, and an actual grave, and we mourn in anticipation of a future resurrection, her Savior had already been raised. There was nothing for her to mourn. Nothing was there. Instead, she should have been rejoicing. This is why she has asked the question twice in this story, woman, why are you weeping? Once by the angels and once by Jesus. Now, the wording in the Greek in regards to the angels imply that the angels were genuinely bewildered. You got to remember, angels aren't all-knowing. They are in genuinely bewildered. Why is this woman mourning in light of the glorious news of the resurrection? Maybe the angels are probably shocked because they wonder, why don't people believe what the Lord tells them? Yet another reason why both the angels and Jesus ask her, why is she weeping, is because they're challenging her to dig deep, to think, to reflect, to remember the Lord's promises In light of the resurrection, is my weeping really necessary? This is the same question we must ask ourselves when we determine the kind of sorrow that is appropriate and the kind of sorrow that is without hope, that should not be marked of a believer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18 says this, and it says, But we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Don't grieve like the rest of the world that doesn't have Christ. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The beauty is something. If you notice in the New Testament, all through Scripture, when it speaks of saints and believers dying, it notes them as have fallen asleep. Why does it do that? It's always an interesting fact. Because for those who believe in Christ, death itself has no final say. It has no permanent impact. And when we process our sorrow over death in light of the resurrection, we hold on to the hope that even death has been rendered into something as mere and as light as merely someone falling asleep. Those in Christ who have died in Christ will one day be raised in Christ as if all along they had just been sleeping. Thus, we do mourn, church, but we do not mourn like those who have no hope like the world. You may never understand why God took your loved one And it always feels like it's too soon. But you can be assured that he sympathizes with us and he is bringing all things to a greater purpose and good in light of his resurrection. So we can see where our sorrow is born from, church. But the next question we have to ask is the one Jesus asked her. Whom are you seeking? Who should we seek in our sorrow? 
The second question that Jesus asks is extremely important to properly address our sorrow. We may understand where our sorrow comes, for, comes from, but more importantly, we need to ask who or what should we be seeking in our sorrow because the world seeks alcohol in their sorrow. They seek things that try to numb the pain in their sorrow. They seek money and distractions to distract them from their sorrow. <coughs> but we, church, have an everlasting hope in our sorrow. That doesn't necessarily take away our pain, but it gives us the strength to endure in our pain. Only a risen Savior who defeated death can offer hope in our sorrow. So the first thing we need to seek is a crucified Savior. We need to seek our crucified Savior. Mary knew Jesus was crucified. She's not ignorant of that. She witnessed it. She was there at every step of it. But she failed to understand its importance, its impact, and the fact that it was prophesied and God's word was fulfilled. If she understood the significance of the crucifixion, she would have understood the significance of the resurrection and rejoiced. Not because Jesus was simply back in the scene, but it meant that all that he had done in his suffering and in his crucifixion was accepted and fully accomplished by God. The Father's wrath against sin was satisfied. Man has been reconciled to God and made new. The forgiveness of sins is available to all who believe. This is what we see, church, when we see the cross. So in your sorrow and pain, seek a Savior who sympathizes with your pain and your sorrow, who's done something about it and offers to you a hope that surpasses any weight of sorrow or burden that this world can offer and put on your shoulders. He bore that. And the hope that we have was bought with the infinitely precious blood of Christ. If you do not know Jesus crucified for your sins, you do not know him at all. You must come to God as a guilty sinner and trust in Jesus as the only perfect sacrifice. If you trust in his shed blood, God will forgive your sins because of what Jesus did on the cross. The second thing we need to seek is we need to seek a risen Savior. We don't seek a Savior who remained dead, church, or our misery remains. Actually, our misery would deepen even more if Jesus remained in the grave. You know why? Because that signals nothing was done. He was merely a man. He fooled everybody that there's no hope beyond the grave. But that's not the case, church. We serve a risen Savior who is risen. And because He is risen, we can confidently run to Him knowing that our faith and confidence is firmly established in a Savior who defeated the fallen things of this world and who can relate to us in all of our difficulties. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 through 18 speaks of Jesus sympathizing with us, that God can actually not empathize, sympathize with us. He's in, he's been with us in our trials and troubles. What does it say in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 through 18? Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers, human, in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiations, basically payment, for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And we see the same pattern repeated in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 through 16, where it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. Or the fact that Jesus is our mediator. He is the one that stands between us and the Father and brings us to the Father through him. 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man of Christ Jesus. Amen. And so, church, why can Jesus sympathize with us so well? Because he suffered like humanity. He suffered in every respect. And why can he mediate for us? Because God has accepted his sacrifice. How do we know that? Because of the resurrection. But ultimately, Jesus can do all of this. Why? Because he lives. What good is sympathy or mediation from a dead corpse? No, church, we serve a living Savior. Is that the Savior that you are seeking in your sorrows? And we see that sympathy of the risen Savior in verse 16 and how Jesus shatters Mary's grief. 
She is seeking a dead body, failing to notice in her sorrow that her risen Lord is right there in front of her. Yet does Jesus rebuke her? Does he scold her? Does he dismiss her for her blindness? No. What do we see? That in her brokenness, Jesus came at the right time to console her. He speaks tenderly to her. He reveals himself to her. Only one thing was necessary for her to recognize Jesus, for Jesus' identity to be established, and that was him uttering her name. We see this idea that Jesus' people know his voice and Jesus calls them by name. In John chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, and then verses 14 through 16, Jesus, speaking of being the good shepherd and his sheep, his people knowing him, and it says, to him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes before him and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee for him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. And then Jesus goes on to say, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. They can recognize my voice. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for my sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, and I must bring them in also. And you know what they'll do? They will listen to my voice. So there'll be one flock, one shepherd. Jesus' sheep, his people, just like Mary, they hear his voice, and they recognize the calling of their master, their savior, their Lord, and they follow him. True believers do not have another shepherd in this world. We don't serve two masters. We don't get pulled by all the other voices in the world that try to pull us in different directions, whether it's our pain, our job, our addictions, whatever is the case. No, we hear our Savior and we follow him because he knows his sheep, his people personally. Our risen Savior, just as John chapter 10 says, still has more sheep to add to the fold. He still seeks individuals. He still calls his sheep by name. You can take your sorrows to him and have a private audience with the good shepherd who knows your name. He can sympathize with all your sorrow and pain. And then lastly, we seek an ascended Savior. See, Mary, upon recognizing Christ, what is her first response? to fall at his feet, to cling to him, to worship to him. But why does Jesus tell her not to? Was it because Jesus was refusing being touched? No, that's not it. But for two reasons. One, he had not ascended yet. And that Jesus was going to remain on earth for 40 more days to teach his disciples key spiritual truths. So he wasn't going to vanish anywhere. There was no point in just clinging and holding on to him. He was going to remain for 40 more days. Another reason was Mary had a job to do. She had to go tell her brethren, or Jesus' brethren, Jesus' brothers of the resurrected Savior that she was the first one to carry the resurrection message. But another reason why Mary didn't need to cling to Jesus is because he was signaling a new relationship with his followers. Nothing would be same after the cross and the resurrection. These followers needed to learn more about Jesus' new state of glory and relate to him differently because though this was the same Jesus, this was not the same relationship that it was when Jesus was walking the earth for three years in his ministry prior to the cross. Jesus is no longer just Mary's rabbi, but he is her savior and her God. And even doubting Thomas acknowledges that because what follows this story? The story of Thomas. And what does Thomas say when he recognizes Jesus? My Lord and my God. Now, we'll speak more about that later. That's a different sermon for another day. But the point being is Mary can no longer relate to Jesus in the same way as she did before, as if, he was in his, as if Jesus was in his state of humility. No, this was the resurrected and glorified Savior, worthy of all honor. 2 Corinthians 5.16 acknowledges this. Paul is speaking of the fact of how believers should relate to Christ and how we should relate to Christ differently upon our salvation and how the disciples relate to him differently after the resurrection. It says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Paul is saying that Jesus is no longer just the humble, suffering servant. No, he is the lion of Judah. 
He is the eternal reigning Lord. He is the one whom all things have been placed under His feet and authority, who sits at the right hand of God. And we must honor Him as such. Church, I give you a warning. We must be careful not to treat our familiarity with Jesus in a juvenile, immature fashion. It makes me cringe. It breaks my heart to see people treat Jesus as if he's no more than just a mere friend. As if he's our bestie. As if he's just our psychiatrist or counselor to hear our problems. As if he's some kind of compassionate boyfriend who simply listens and understands, but he makes no demands on our lives. Let me tell you something. Yes, in one sense, Jesus is a friend of sinners, and he hears us, and he's infinite in his grace and his compassion and his mercy. You can go to him with all your sorrows. He sympathizes, but he is also our Lord, and we shame the name of Christ when we treat him as no better than just one of our other friends we talk to and not our reigning Lord who lives forever. <clears throat> The point I am making is the Savior that we seek in our sorrow does not just handle our sorrow with great compassion and sympathy. He's not a Savior who, oh, well, I have sympathy and compassion for you, but I can't really do anything about it. No, He is a Lord who has all authority and all power to do anything He wants about it. No, the Savior we seek has ascended and he reigns as king and he has the authority and power to assure that all he has promised in spite of our sorrows and troubles, he will accomplish. He will make all things right and make them even better in even a more grand and glorious way than we could imagine. So how do we seek Jesus in our sorrows really briefly? One, with honesty. I want us to see that Jesus met Mary in the midst of her sorrows. He didn't meet Mary when she dried up her tears, when she gave him better answers, when she got her act together and could understand. No, the point being is in the deepest part of her grief, at her breaking point, he meets her and he speaks her name. Mary's sorrow was intense. The Greek implies that she was wailing loudly. She was lamenting. She was expressing deep sorrow. And her sorrow was personal because in verse 13, what did she call Jesus? My Lord. It was a personal hurt and a personal pain. Jesus later recognizes that personalness because what does he do? He calls Mary by name. Mary didn't try to cover up her hurt, her pain, or her confusion. I mean, she answers Jesus honestly because she doesn't recognize Jesus. Yet she met with Christ as she was in the midst of her struggles. Jesus knows your struggles, church. Come to him as you are. Be honest with the Savior who already knows your heart. Secondly, we need to seek Jesus with faithfulness. I want us to see something else about Mary. When everyone else left the tomb, when Peter and John, two of Jesus' closest disciples, they left bewildered, not understanding, Mary stayed. She loved her Lord and came early to the garden to express that love in preparing his body. And what do we see? Jesus rewards faithfulness. Mary is the first one to experience the resurrected Jesus. Not Peter, not James, not John, but Mary. And this is hugely insignificant, or this is hugely significant, considering that she was a woman. In first century Jewish culture, a woman's testimony was seen as unreliable. And yet Jesus entrusts her with the first person with the resurrection message. But this wasn't just any Mary. She wasn't Mary, the mother of Jesus, or Mary Bethany, the sister of Martha, whom Jesus had a close relationship. She was Mary Magdalene. The only time we really hear about her directly before this point is Luke chapter 8, verse 2. But she loved Jesus, and Jesus rewarded that faithfulness. Proverbs 8, 17 speaks of this. It says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently, those who seek me diligently find me. Now, this passage is speaking of wisdom, but the interesting thing to note is almost every biblical scholar relates the fact that Jesus is the wisdom spoken of in Proverbs. Jesus is the word of God made flesh. He is wisdom personified. So the point being is, seek Christ as you are. Seek him diligently, seek him faithfully, and know that God is faithful to reward those who seek him with the greatest gift he can bestow, which is his presence. And lastly, we seek Jesus with obedience. I am positive in a powerful encounter that Mary, she just wanted to stay there. She just wanted to keep Jesus to herself and bask in his holy presence. But Jesus is her Lord and our Lord. 
And there's important news to be sent out. And who does Jesus rely on to send that news? Good old Mary. And who does Jesus rely on today to bring that news? His church, his people. Full of broken people who are made new in Christ. He told Mary to stop clinging to him because now wasn't the time to sit and wait. It was to go and tell. And what do we see in the transition between verses 17 and 18? Jesus tells her what to do. And what does verse 18 say? It starts with the word, so. So because Jesus told her all this, and because she loved Jesus and saw Jesus as Lord, what was her response? So she went and did what the Lord had told her to do. It was only natural for her to obey because she loves him. She recognized the importance of the message she was given and the messenger. So lastly, church, in seeking Christ, understand that he does not exist to make all your desires come to pass, to answer your requests exactly as you expect, and to never challenge you beyond your comfort. He isn't just our Savior. He is our Lord. And what he commands of us is ultimately for our benefit, even if we don't fully understand it or even if we don't feel, feel, feel fully comfortable with it. As you walk in obedience with Christ, you too, your experience, your sorrow will turn into hope. So as we get ready to have our invitation, God himself, Jesus Christ, chose to reveal himself after the resurrection. Firstly, to Mary Magdalene, the insignificant, I say that with quotes, demon-possessed woman trapped in sin who Jesus rescued and freed her from her life of sin. What wondrous hope is there for us today, church, for those of us who have been trapped in our demons and our sins and our oppression, chained to our addiction, burdened with our sorrow and our pain? If he would choose someone like Mary to be his first witness of the resurrection, to turn her sorrow into hope, to reward her searching, then certainly he can save you no matter where you are at and what you are dealing with. And he can use you like he did, Mary, to be a witness of his resurrection and his good news. So my challenge to you this morning is the same question Jesus asked Mary. Why are you weeping today? And who are you seeking in your struggles if regardless of your past sorrow, pain, and heartache, you faithfully, obediently, and honestly seek Jesus, you will find a loving, gracious, and merciful Savior who will turn your sorrow into hope, your tragedy into victory, your dead life into joyful living. Have you put your faith in Jesus as the only one to be saved? Have you repented and confessed to him your sin? Have you submitted to him as Lord and Savior of your life? If you have done that this morning, then I want you to stand and sing praises that our God doesn't necessarily remove us dealing with sorrow in our life, but he takes the sorrow and brings a much deeper hope so that our joy remains. But if you don't know Christ this morning and you want to know the Savior who turns, makes all, brings about all things for his good and our good, then I'm going to be down here at the front. Come down. I would love to talk with you, walk you through that, what it means to trust in Jesus. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for your sacrifice. I thank you for the glorious news of the resurrection that turned Mary's deepest grief in her heart and you met her where she was at and it turned into joy because her hope is confirmed in you. So may we stand and sing praises of your amazing love, of your victory in your resurrection and that our hope is assured no matter the things we deal with in this world, no matter the sorrow and loss that we experience, our hope is assured in the one who died, who was risen, and who is ascended, sitting at the right hand of God. You are our Savior and our Lord. Help us, Lord, leave this place ready to serve you. In Christ's name, amen.